This is the broadcaster at 40, program number 4, for playback Friday, February 12th. The Broadcaster at 40. This week, WTIC has been celebrating its 40th anniversary of broadcasting. And throughout the week, we have been presenting our story, the story of the Broadcaster at 40. Today, we will be taking an audio visit to the most recent decade in the history of WTIC, the period 1955 to the present. As 1955 got underway, WTIC microphones were in the hall of the House of Connecticut State Capitol to broadcast the inaugural address of the state's new governor, Abraham Ribicoff. WTIC listeners also heard President Dwight Eisenhower deliver his State of the Union address. On Hartford's Main Street, the 15th annual Mila Dimes campaign collected $107,065.30. Over the 15-year period, the WTIC Hartford Current Mila Dimes campaigns had collected $1,131,939.39. A special events crew was on hand in Newington for the felling of a giant white oak tree in February 1955. The timbers cut from this Newington Oak joined others collected from around the nation in the reconstruction of the steeple at the Old North Church in Boston, the steeple of Paul Revere fame. On April 12, 1955, the results of the Salk polio vaccine tests were announced nationally. On a special program that night, it was revealed that only three out of 18,000 Connecticut children who had received the vaccine the previous year, had contracted polio, and none of these suffered paralysis. When the Connecticut General Assembly adjourned after midnight on June 9th, WTIC was the only radio station with a crew on hand at the state capitol to give the public the story of the hectic closing moments. So confused were the proceedings in the last minutes of the session that doubt existed as to the passage of at least one bill, a gasoline tax bill. The Senate had previously amended the bill, changing the starting date of the tax increase to July 1, 1955. Both the notes of House stenographer Mrs. Alice Miller and House clerk John Wasson showed no amendment had been acted on in the House. To confirm the official transcript and the clerk's notes, both Mr. Wasson and Mrs. Miller came to the WTIC studios to listen to a tape recording of the final minutes of the session. From the WTIC broadcast, it was confirmed that the gasoline tax bill passed by the Senate did not pass in the House. And on November 15, 1955, WTIC listeners first heard probabilities broadcast for the weather. Five out of ten for rain, two out of ten for snow, and so on. Just about three months before the new system for reporting weather probabilities was introduced, the Northeast suffered one of its worst disasters. On August 10, 1955, at 7.15 p.m., a special broadcast, Connecticut on the Alert, was presented, telling how the state was preparing for Hurricane Connie. The governor and other state officials reported. Additional reports came from key points along the Connecticut shore, and WTIC's news director, Tom Eaton, vacationing on Cape Cod, reported on preparations there. Hurricane Diane followed quickly on Connie's heels, bearing down on the state just one week later. Beginning shortly after 4.45 a.m. on Friday, August 19th, and continuing until 1 a.m. Monday, August 22nd, WTIC special events crews kept listeners informed of tragic flood developments in Connecticut and elsewhere in the Northeast. Not many hours had passed before it became evident that the state was in serious trouble. Governor Ribicoff opened emergency headquarters in the state armory, and a WTIC man was constantly at the headquarters. Other announcers accompanied the governor on his many trips into disaster areas, while Bob Tyrrell flew over the affected areas. 
News Director Tom Eaton spoke early in the storm with Captain Ed Polanski, a helicopter pilot of the 43rd Division Air Section. Captain Polanski was at the controls of one of the first craft into the hard-hit Farmington Valley. We arrived at Hartford approximately 7 o'clock in the morning. It was raining quite heavily and the clouds were very low. We received information that in Unionville there were quite a few people stranded. So we proceeded from Hartford trying to get over the mountains to the other side of in the Farmington Valley. Uh, we were unsuccessful on our first try and had to go south to uh, try to cross the mountains where it was a little bit lower. Uh, upon arriving in Unionville, we were informed that there was a family of five people uh, stranded on the housetop uh, out in the swift current. They tried to get boats to them, but it was impossible because of the water rushing by the house. The only way we could get our helicopter in was to let a line float toward the houses. The house was jammed under a tree and it made it impossible for the Bell helicopter to hover above the house and drop a line. We took approximately 200 feet of rope, hovered the helicopter as close to the house as possible and floated the rope in. When the people at the house got the rope, they tied it around one of their members and we pulled the people through the water to the bank. Uh, on the bank, four or five of the townspeople untied the people, pulled them up on the bank, and then we went back for another trip. We got approximately, well, we got four people off the house, and in going back for the other two that were there, the house collapsed, and we did not see where the two uh, others went, two men. We later heard that they were found in some trees and were rescued, but we did not get it confirmed. Uh, after these people were deposited on the shore, the bridge on both sides of them, a railroad bridge, was washed away and they were stranded again. In the meantime, I had returned back to Hartford to get more gas, and on the way in Farmington, found four more people that were sitting on a sandbar and dropped them off at the golf course in Farmington. Uh, upon returning to Unionville, I landed on the top of a building on which these people were and took them to the first aid center at uh, the high school in Unionville. Other reports began pouring into the station bringing the story of the disaster to homes throughout southern New England. I'm talking now with uh, Major Charles A. Hatfield of the Connecticut Air National Guard. At the moment he is at Bradley Field in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Uh, Major Hatfield, what's your story? Uh, this morning one of our helicopters landed in Pine Meadow in the New Hartford area. Mr. Harold E. Drake of Pine Meadow, the chairman of the fire district there, gave our pilot this information. He says Pine Meadow cut off by washout on Route 44 between New Hartford and Pine Meadow. State of Kingdom Bridge out. Damage here, terrific. Two highway employees known dead. Three families in Satan Kingdom District unaccounted for. Their homes swept away. Flood covers entire valley. And here is a portion of a report from the Civil Defense Director in the town of Simsbury. Decontamination squads have been organized and are now operating in the East Weetog area. Milk stations are set up at the public schools for babies and will be open at 6 o'clock this evening. Fresh water station has been set up at the Simsbury Firehouse. Approximately 250 evacuees are being housed and fed currently. And from the fire chief in Granby. The three fire companies of this town are on duty all night and rescued 12 persons from their homes. Uh, also, uh, some animals in the pasture. The medical authorities in Farmington issue a warning. All the persons in the Farmington area who have been working in the water or who are going to return to their flooded homes uh, should have typhoid immunization. The station's disaster service culminated in a 72-hour long flood bank campaign for funds in behalf of the Red Cross. It swung into operation at 11.30 p.m. Tuesday, August 23rd, less than two days after the station's 68-hour coverage of the flood disaster itself. Almost immediately, the telephone switchboard was swamped with calls. By morning, gifts totaling $6,000 had been acknowledged. At the end of 24 hours, $58,000 had been pledged. At the 48-hour mark, 
the amount had soared to $144,000. And when the program signed off 72 hours later, $233,350 had been pledged. Over $50 a minute, $3,000 an hour for 72 hours. Long after the program signed off, funds continued to flood the station. The WTIC flood bank was officially closed on the Ross Miller program on October 4th. In the studio were WTIC President Paul W. Morency and Charles J. Cole, Vice Chairman of the Hartford Chapter, American National Red Cross. Replying to a comment by Ross Miller about the small piece of paper he held in his hand, Mr. Morency said, It is very small for the power it uh, contains. It's a check drawn on the Hartford National Bank and Trust Company in the amount of $321,197.21. And it represents the total which is gathered in the flood bank drive of WTIC. It represents the generosity of thousands of our Connecticut citizens and also of thousands from Massachusetts and adjoining states. We here at WTIC uh, are actually astounded at the amount that was raised because we have had quite a bit of experience in, in uh, fundraising drives and this was uh, an extraordinary thing in our experience. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to Mr. Cole here this check which will be used in alleviating the suffering and the uh, privations which have been endured by Connecticut citizens. On the world and national news scene in 1956, listeners heard of the solution to the great Brinks robbery. Eight men were sentenced to life terms for the nearly $3 million heist in 1950. Russian communists disavowed the Stalin line. Movie star Grace Kelly married Prince Rainier of Monaco. And the United States made its first airdrop of an H-bomb over a remote Pacific island. President Eisenhower underwent surgery, and Egypt seized the Suez Canal. The Hungarian revolt brought the free world to its feet, and Dwight Eisenhower, recovered from surgery, was re-elected to the presidency of the United States. In Hartford, the year's leading story was the tragic destruction of St. Joseph's Cathedral by fire. WTIC listeners heard Ed Anderson describe the devastating fire. We cannot make any predictions here, but we can make comparisons. Compared to when we first arrived on the scene, the smoke has increased in intensity, there is deep red flame inside the building. It is rolling, the smoke that is, slowly up over the dome of the rear of the cathedral into this uh, December sky, which is uh, registering a temperature of 16 degrees at this time during the day. A light snow flurry is falling and thus hampering to some extent the firemen, although they have earlier stated that they didn't have the hardship that they did uh, Saturday night when battling the St. Patrick's fire. Now, kind of holes that I can see going up one of the aerial ladders on which are perched four firemen. It is now raging out of control. The Hartford firemen seem to have lost this battle to save the 64-year-old cathedral. Flames are pouring out both sides up the top. The dome, which is now encased in thick, heavy, towering smoke, rising cumbersomely into the air, is lined also with the red of the eager, hungry flames which lick up through it. In January 1957, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe from World War II days was inaugurated for his second term as Commander-in-Chief of the United States. You, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear... I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear... ...that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability... And will, to the best of my ability... Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Thank you very Good much. Class. The Russians astounded the world with Sputnik, and Governor Faubus of Arkansas astounded the United States by forcing the government's hand in integrating Little Rock schools. In Hartford, years of preparation were rewarded when the FCC gave WTIC permission to telecast on Channel 3 in September of 1957. 
For WTIC, the advent of Channel 3 meant tremendous expansion in staff and a need for expanded physical facilities. On April 14, 1960, ground was broken for WTIC's new home, Broadcast House, in the city's first downtown urban renewal project. The chairman of Constitution Plaza, Incorporated, Gladden W. Baker, addressed the gathering. This uh, street here to the east is called Front Street. Years ago, when life was more simple here, Front Street was a, an important location coming down from the old state house down to the river, a gentle grade at a more quiet, quiet time. It was uh, sort of the front door at that time. After that, it came on less favorable days. We had a lot of slums here. But now, when this project is finished, the Constitution Plaza, this will again be the front door of Hartford. Thank you all. I, I am uh, delighted to be here. I'm proud to be introduced by your distinguished governor, Governor Rivercar. It was the day before the 1960 presidential election when John F. Kennedy came to town. For him, the groundbreaking had taken place months before in Los Angeles. His trip to Hartford only enhanced what was to be the biggest Democratic landslide in the state's history. I, I am uh, delighted to be here. I'm proud to be introduced by your distinguished governor, Governor Rivercar. This campaign will be all over in uh, 12 hours. And it has been a campaign which has taken, uh, in some form or other, at least uh, many months, stretching all the way back to the first primary in the state of New Hampshire in January of this year. After uh, 12 hours, my responsibility as the standard bearer for the Democratic Party to present the issues in this campaign ceases. And so does that of Mr. Nixon. Your responsibility as citizens of the great republic then begins. And tomorrow, November 8th, you must make the most sober and responsible judgment that any citizens of any free country are called upon to make to choose the next president of the United States. I believe. Thank you. I believe. We'll do very well in 1964 when all your. I believe that the issues which separate Mr. Nixon and myself present a clear choice to any voter. He must make a judgment about what his view is of the position of our country, what his view is of its needs, what his view is of its responsibilities. And when he has made that judgment about his own position, then he can make a judgment between Mr. Nixon and myself. The judgment was made, and in less than three months, John F. Kennedy was standing in front of the Capitol in Washington. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Lift off. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Okay, hey, you're on your way. Uh, sir, we're going to allow him to drive uh, Black House, this is Mercury Control Center procedure. Lift off, let's say okay. Main safety is green. Yes, he's still on fire. All right, let's go. Lock on. 
Tomorrow. Young men were in the news, literally soaring to new heights. Alan Shepard became America's first man in space. He was followed quickly by Gus Grissom, whose Mercury capsule hit both extremes, from the heights of Buck Rogers to the depths of Davy Jones. Well, the sun is coming in, and so all I can see really is just the darkness. Okay, the G's are staying as still. Roger, we're in your loud and clear. Roger. G's are falling. We're up to six. There's nine. There's about ten. And my hand on his uh, arm of Mercury, that's pretty good. There I got. From aboard the aircraft carrier Randolph, this is the story of the recovery of Virgil Grissom from the sea as he escaped from the hatch of his helicopter, or rather his Liberty Bell capsule. Liberty Bell number seven is down below in the briny blue. Hartford's Constitution Plaza was taking shape. Out of the mid-city pits were growing the magnificent structures which would soon be a model to the entire country of what one city could do to revitalize its central core. The first building occupied was Broadcast House. At the dedication of WTIC's new home on the evening of November 27, 1961, Paul W. Morency addressed the studio and listening audience. May I say that it is a good feeling to be with friends this evening. A most important evening in the history of WTIC and its offspring, WTIC, FM, and TV. This is a time of renewal, a time of thanksgiving, and a time of rededication. Broadcast House, this new four-story home for our three stations, is the first unit to be completed and occupied in Constitution Plaza. An urban renewal which boldly foretells a bright future for Hartford. The challenging opportunity to serve the vigorous, enterprising mind and spirit of the people of Connecticut and southern New England has been ours for over 37 years. We wish to thank you, the people, who have listened to our radio voice for those 37 years and for the past four years have welcomed Channel 3 into your homes. We wish to thank our friends and associates who work with us in this broadcast house. This industry, like many others, is one that calls for exhaustive effort and complete dedication. Here at Broadcast House, we have 164 dedicated people on our staff. Some have been with us for several years. Others have been with WTIC since it started in 1925. I can't begin to tell you how hard these men and women have worked to make our stations and this moment possible. This is Dick Bertell at the scene of a multi-alarm fire at the Hartford Hospital. In front of me, as I face the front of Hartford Hospital, is a maze of fire trucks, fire hose, and firefighting equipment of all description. This is a fire confined to the 9th, 10th, and 11th floor. There are approximately... Yes, fire struck at a community hospital again in December 1961, just 16 years after the tragic Nile Street Hospital fire. In mid-afternoon on the 8th, fire and emergency vehicles raced to Hartford Hospital. I was part of the WTIC special events crew that arrived with the fire trucks and saw the billowing smoke pouring from ninth floor windows. TIC newsman Dick O'Brien saw it this way. I'm speaking from the ninth floor. I've worked my way up now to the, to the disaster spot itself, and we have a figure of nine persons dead here on the ninth floor of Hartford Hospital. That figure comes from State Police Commissioner Leo Mulcahy, who I talked with just moments ago. He believes there are three more dead on another floor. We do not know exactly which one. We believe it probably is down on the 8th, but we are uncertain. Known dead here on the ninth floor, nine persons in this fire. They are now mopping up. The scene is one of uh, water-filled halls, uh, soaked walls, uh, debris, there are firemen, there are priests, there are nurses, there are doctors, there are stretchers. People are being taken out. It appears now that uh, perhaps all of the patients have been... No, I can see another one now moving down the hall. 
uh, attended by uh, at least six or seven people coming over toward the elevator. They are working their way down the hall. It was believed at first that uh, this fire had escaped a tragic note, but it now is, is a definite figure confirmed by state police. We have nine persons dead here on the ninth floor where the, uh, where the major trouble uh, came in the, in the fire, in the, uh, in the trash chute. There was an explosion. And uh, the patient they were wheeling, I thought, was going to be uh, wheeled by me. They are now moving up to uh, another wing, going down the elevator. Uh, it appears to be an elderly woman. Uh, people are just soaking wet. Uh, dirt and debris scattered throughout the halls. Uh, we had to work our way up uh, a back stairway where firemen are, are uh, washing cascading water down the, uh, down the stairways. Nine dead. It appears to be at least 12 dead now here in the Hartford Hospital fire. Dick O'Brien on the ninth floor at Hartford Hospital. America soared on in the space race with John Glenn in the driver's seat in 1962. Lift off. The MA6 vehicle has lifted off. The MA6 vehicle has lifted off. The trajectory looks good. The MA6 vehicle has off the line. In the days that followed, John Glenn was the embodiment of everybody's All-American. And in the United States, Hartford was judged an All-American, too. Selected for the second time as the most outstanding city of its size in America, Hartford received nationwide acclaim. This acclaim was based largely on the city's dynamic accomplishments in proving its ability to renew. From what had previously been one of the city's most blighted areas, gleaming new buildings were now casting clean, modern shadows. And to the west of the city center, from the ashes and tumbled brownstone that had once been St. Joseph's Cathedral, a towering spire lofted skyward over a magnificent new edifice. At the same time, high in the sky above, the space age came one giant step nearer reality. A relatively small spinning ball of electronic gadgetry was acting as a relay station in space for radio and television signals being transmitted between the American and European continents. The first sounds Americans heard from the communication satellite 3,000 miles out in space was our national anthem. Off the coast of southern Florida, almost within shouting distance of our mainland, Cuban sword rattling was augmented by Russian rockets. Over the voices of an aroused American people, the determined words of John F. Kennedy were heard with clarity, especially in Moscow and Havana. Another American astronaut captured the lead position in early 1963 news stories. Gordon Cooper was the first American to spend an extended period in space. Late in November, the phone lines to WTIC's Mike Line program were crowded as usual. When is the best time to trim young maple trees? Right. All right, we'll ask, and if anyone knows, uh, we'll invite them to call us today. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you. Bye-bye. Yes,
When is the best time to trim young maple trees? Floyd, I have something uh, rather important from the WTIC newsroom in the form of a bulletin. President Kennedy is reported to have been wounded by an assassin in Dallas, Texas. There are no further details available at this time. We repeat, President Kennedy has been wounded by an assassin in Dallas, Texas. We will have further details as received. I'm sure everybody joins us in deploring this regretful news. Well, I should think but we'll so. We'll bring details as soon as we possibly can. We certainly will. We'll stay around right on top of that. All right, let's see if we can uh, continue on with Mike Line here oh, while awaiting any more news from our newsroom. Hello? Oh, golly. Isn't that awful? Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, well, I got the recipe. This is Rod Fishman. Yes, right. Okay. Oh, my. I just took my breath away. Uh, did ours, too. I think so. <sighs> Floyd Richards and Bob Ellsworth tried to carry on with Mike Line. Then another bulletin. Will you hold it just yeah, a minute, Roz? Sure. We have some. Here are further there. details from the WTIC newsroom. President Kennedy and Governor John B. Connolly of Texas were cut down by an assassin's bullets as they toured downtown Dallas in an open automobile today. The president, his limp body cradled in the arms of his wife, was rushed to Parkland Hospital. We will give you further details as received. Well, this rather changes the complexion of many, many things at this time, and uh, it looks as if we have two national victims here, the governor and the president, at this first reading. This is a very regretful thing, and uh, the kind of news which I'm afraid is a little bit more than I care to handle, I, but we've got to be on the job anyway. Uh, we'll continue along, Floyd. Oh, Roz, you're uh, <laughs> right in the middle of a... A terrible thing here. Perhaps we, we'd be best to just keep right on going as best we can. Mm. What was there to say? What was there to do? At WTIC, work began immediately, preparing special programs of music. Through NBC and our own WTIC newsroom, listeners were able to witness every event of those tragic days. A somber America saw 1964 into being, but 64 was to see our city, state, and nation attain yet greater heights. In Hartford, Constitution Plaza was formally dedicated on May 11th. Herbert Kramer, vice president of the Travelers Insurance Companies, was master of ceremonies. Constitution Plaza is a threefold dedication. We dedicate this plaza to the memory of those who, in the year 1639, 325 years ago, framed the fundamental orders, the first written constitution in the world by which people guaranteed their freedom through self-government. And I would ask you to strike the bell in memory of the framers of that constitution because of the name you gave this plaza, Constitution Plaza. Give it a good whack. We dedicate this plaza also to the memory of those who fought and died in all the wars that this nation has fought, who fought for this Constitution and the rights under this Constitution. But we dedicate this bell not only to those who died, but to all of those who in the past have given of themselves, who have sacrificed their time and their energies and their lives to make this city and to make this state great under the principles of that Constitution. Mr. J. Doyle DeWitt, President of the Travelers, I think it is fitting that you, as an old Navy man and as a man who has given so much of yourself to this community, that you strike this bell once in memory of those who have sacrificed themselves. The nation's Southland and later the North were to witness violent clashes over civil rights. On July 2nd, 1964, the bill which John F. Kennedy had fostered finally became the law. I'm about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I want to take this occasion to talk to you about what that law means to every American. 188 years ago this week, a small band of valiant men began a long struggle for freedom. They pledged their lives 
their fortunes, and their sacred honor, not only to found a nation, but to forge an ideal of freedom, not only for political independence, but for personal liberty, not only to eliminate foreign rule, but to establish the rule of justice in the affairs of men. That struggle was a turning point in our history. Today, in far corners of distant continents, the ideals of those American patriots still shape the struggles of men who hunger for freedom. This is a proud triumph. Yet those who founded our country knew that freedom would be secure only if each generation fought to renew and enlarge its meaning. From the Minutemen at Concord to the soldiers in Vietnam, each generation has been equal to that trust. Americans of every race and color have died in battle to protect our freedom. Americans of every race and color have worked to build a nation of widening opportunities. It wasn't long after Constitution Plaza had been officially dedicated before the plaza became a center for the community's newest cultural endeavor, Plaza 7. The seven lively arts performed daily on the plaza. The Plaza 7 program drew thousands to the city's new center, but the crowds for Plaza 7 were to be increased multifold when on November 27th, the young daughter of Hartford's mayor, William Glynn, turned a special key, which transformed the area into a wonderland of light. 120,000 tiny white lights, animated displays, superb wire sculptures, and music in every corner of the plaza. Every day something new happened. Live music was presented from a special music shell on the North Plaza. And the people, thousands came daily from all points in southern New England to view the incomparable plaza display, installed and operated by Broadcast Plaza Incorporated, a new firm which had emerged earlier in the year when Constitution Plaza Incorporated and the Travelers Broadcasting Service Corporation had combined operations. As our 40th anniversary drew nigh, WTIC was honored by the men and women of the broadcast industry for its years of pioneering and leadership. This past Monday night in New York, Mr. Claire McCullough, President of Broadcasters Foundation, presented Mr. Paul W. Morenci, President of Broadcast Plaza, with one of the industry's most coveted awards, the Golden Mike. I shall, I shall read the brief inscription. The Broadcast Pioneers, Fifth Annual Mike Award to WTIC for distinguished contribution to the art of broadcasting and in recognition of dedicated adherence to quality, integrity, and responsibility in programming and management so awarded this February the 8th, 1965. Thank you, Claire. Governor Dempsey, Mr. Chairman, FCC Commissioners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is obvious that this is a great moment for WTIC. It's a great moment because in being presented with this award, we are being honored by our own colleagues. It's a great moment because our call letters are being added to a roster of distinguished stations, the call letters of which you see back of me here. 
And it is a great moment because this award highlights another major event in the WTIC history, our 40th anniversary. And I am very proud, of course, to accept this award. I accept it on behalf of our staff, on behalf of our graduates, some of whom are here tonight, and on behalf of our parent company, the Travelers Insurance Company. In honoring our station, you are in fact honoring the staff of 180 men and women, for it is they who have built the record which is being cited here tonight. I can assure you they are dedicated, hard-working people, and they are enriching the WTIC tradition. Also a part of this tradition, and to an important degree responsible for it, are alumni, who you will honor also this evening. Our parent corporation, the Travelers Insurance Company, is well represented here this evening by Sterling Trucker, the president, by Millard Bartels, the chairman of its insurance executive committee, and other officers and directors. These men have long been among the station's strongest supporters, and the station has benefited greatly by their counsel. Like that famous Hartford gentleman, Mark Twain, Radio has had the rare experience of surviving the announcement of its own death. And like Mark Twain, radio has left no doubt that the obituary was quite exaggerated. Well, radio is still young, still growing, still changing. The annual sale of 25 million receiving sets is proof that radio is the indispensable companion of more and more millions of people each year. And radio is that instant medium, always first with the important events as they occur all over the world, the functioning of our government, our rapport with our allies, and indeed the status of the world depends in some degree on the speed and accuracy of radio. And radio will continue to change as the world changes and as new needs arise. But above all, radio and broadcasters in this country will remain dedicated to the preservation and defense of our basic freedoms, including that cornerstone of democracy, freedom of speech. In 1848, a New England clergyman, Theodore Parker, and these words. Truth never yet fell dead in the streets. It has such affinity with the soul of man, the seed, however broadcast, will catch somewhere and produce its hundredfold. I know that our industry will continue to play a major role in the dissemination of that truth. One last thought. Forty years ago next Wednesday, Mr. Walter G. Coles, who first proposed that the company add broadcast to its functions, signed on WTIC for the first time with these words. We look upon ourselves as trustees of that part of the air which we shall from time to time occupy, and we mean to have due regard for that trusteeship. WTIC will continue to have due regard for that trusteeship, and this award will serve as a constant reminder. Thank you. The highlight of the evening was entertainment provided by two Hartfordites. Dr. Moshe Paranoff, formerly director of music for WTIC, conducted the 40-piece orchestra as Miss Gianna D'Angelo, Connecticut's most recent contribution to the Metropolitan Opera, sang. I'd like to sing for you now a song that is a favorite of mine, and I just learned a little while ago, that is a few days ago, that it is a very great favorite with Paul Morenci, and I would like to dedicate it to him. Yours is my heart alone. <laughs>
no charm. Yours every thought I own. Our love, the theme of every dream. That makes life seem worthwhile. Dwells in your eyes. And the spell of your smile. This, then, has been part of the history of the broadcaster at 40. From the early days, when less than a handful of people staffed the station, which broadcast a few hours a day, a few days a week, WTIC has grown to be one of the largest broadcasting operations in the country. With more than 180 employees working around the clock every day of the year to maintain our position of leadership in the community, the state, and the nation. Looking to the future, Let's just say that for the broadcaster, life begins at 40. This series, The Broadcaster at 40, has been narrated by Dick Bertel, written and produced by Dave Wilkinson. Some of the music presented in this series has been heard through the courtesy of the Hartford Musicians Association, Local 400, American Federation of Musicians.